Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing fantastic and that you're all having an absolutely incredible day. And without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Another day, another wave of optimism within the cryptocurrency space as a lot of people are kind of relatively all on the exact same page as to where they believe the market is about to go. According to Bloomberg, Bitcoin is primed for an unprecedented rise to fifth, no, no excuse me, 500,000 US dollars. I saw the five and just kind of assumed it's 500,000 US dollars. For those of you who have maybe missed any of the other Videos over the course of the last couple of weeks, shame on you. The other part is that a lot of analysts have basically been coming out with relatively the exact same information. The idea on the lowest end is that Bitcoin is going to pass by $100,000. That seems like all but a given. The As far as the peak of where prices could go. There is a lot of uh, 150, 200,000 by the end of next year. That is to say the end of 2024. And by the time we get to 2025, the price predictions range anywhere from 300,000 to $600,000 per Bitcoin because of the halving, because of interest rate cuts, because of multiple Bitcoin ETFs, and also because of the uh, Bitcoin supply crunch smash falling down, not being as high uh, as it was circulating before. We've gotten news of accumulation for the last couple of years. And we have seen that, as in the other videos, there are whales who are buying, and, the, and I mean... It's not like they're buying like a million coins per per uh, per time, but it's, it's like 150, 280 coins. And it actually has an effect on the price because there's not a lot left on exchanges. Bloomberg asserted that the assets recent surge above $42,000 has spotlighted the beginning of a cycle that can spearhead this bullish rally, they said. Bitcoin topping $42,000 is just the start of a fresh crypto super cycle that will push the world's biggest token above half a million dollars in what adherents say is the new monetary order taking Wall Street by storm. That's a very strong sentence. <clears throat> like Bloomberg, other prominent finance figures have made massive bullish calls in the previous years. Last year, Mike Novogratz, the CEO of Galaxy Digital, Predicted that Bitcoin would hit half a million dollars within five years. This is for those of you who also don't know. Now, literally, no one knows if this is going to happen, but a lot of people are predicting that this may be the last uh, similar cycle that we've seen comparative to the, the other ones. The idea was that Bitcoin before was relatively speculative, and therefore after a speculative period of growth, it would fall down for around two years. The idea is that it's no longer speculative, and now Wall Street and all these other major brands are definitely into it. So we could see simply that prices would rise quite dramatically and then fall down by a bit upon the expectation of prices like are supposed to be falling, but then they actually only continue to move up. This is why we're like you'll start seeing it more and more as well. I, I don't know if I've really put it in other videos. But there are a lot of people who think that, like, we won't collapse this time. Like, it's more of a, we know that the big players are here. They can't really lie and say or, like, relinquish or sell the entirety of their positions, especially if these are ETFs and they are being held by other companies. Although he backpedaled on the time frame, he maintained that the cryptocurrency could surge to those levels. Similarly, Kathy Wood predicted that Bitcoin will be hitting $1.4 million, $1.4 million per coin by the year 2030. The idea of a $1 million Bitcoin, boys and girls, for those of you who don't know, means that nearly all 
nearly all of the world has kind of like bent the knee to Bitcoin and has kind of declared like, we get it. We can't stop it. We have to use it. We're going to start collecting it. It is the new digital gold. Whether we're going to get there in six years and half of a month, I don't really know, but you can't begin to imagine what that would mean for the like traditional financial system if Bitcoin is over a million. Nonetheless, $1.4 million by 2030. I mean, it would be spectacular to see, but on the other end, anyone you know who doesn't own Bitcoin is kind of in the poo-poo. Yeah. So there's a lot every single day of price predictions where people think things are going. They're all relatively on the same page. There there are not many deviations. There are some people who are still relatively negative. It's, you know, sure, why not? Be more realistic. There are a lot of people who are like, no, we're going to top out at 100K or 130K. I don't think people really understand exactly what's taking place and like the significance of the names who are in this market, but that's uh, that's for us to discuss in 2025 when we see if everything has gone completely uh, parabolic. That's the price predictions and optimism news. And yeah, let's move on. In sure, why not? This was also quite popular news, and I get it, but it's also like, no one no one could do this before. A company called Jan3, like January without the UERI, Jan and then the number three, a leading Bitcoin technology company, has unveiled their latest venture. Jan3 Financial is aimed at onboarding nation states or countries and high net worth individuals into Bitcoin, according to a recent press release. This move attempts to address the growing demand for acquiring and securing Bitcoin among nation states, public entities, corporations, and high net worth individuals. And that's why I said I was like, no one has been able to do this before. I understand that um, nations would want to acquire Bitcoin, but I feel like there must be other countries who've in companies who've you know they've already been working with as if this like this wasn't a a thing before you understand what i'm saying like this isn't this was this news was released as something like whoa they're going to be helping countries and it's like how do you how do you think countries have already been acquiring tons of okay they said and i quote nation states and corporations require robust means to acquire bitcoin We can offer them bespoke solutions to accumulate their Bitcoin treasury reserves. This was said by Samson Mao, the CEO of Jan3. They said the expertise of the Jan3 team uniquely positions us to meet the distinct needs of our nation state clientele, offering unmatched solutions concerning Bitcoin acquisition, custody, and the high grade security they demand. So I guess they would be the custody solution. I don't know if I would no never mind. I was going to say I, I don't know if I would feel comfortable as a as a nation state which I am not with someone like holding like 35,000 bitcoin for me. But then I was like, "Wait, I've I've also used cryptocurrency exchanges before, so I guess it's like the same but on a on a larger frame." Um yeah, very popular news. Um it's nice to see that people get excited about accumulation news. I don't really know exactly uh, where to place this one, but cool. Um, no list, no list at all as to which countries and or companies are trying to acquire Bitcoin. But normally one does not create a venture like this unless they know that there's a significant amount of demand behind the scenes for people trying to acquire all of this. So cool. Um, In honesty, this is probably the last time that we're going to hear about them unless they end up releasing public numbers. I highly doubt that we are going to get news that from Jan 3, hey, Zimbabwe has 16,000 Bitcoin. Like, I don't think that they're going to be openly announcing any of that information, but that's the... um, 
That's the way it goes. Very popular news. Congratulations to them on helping rich people become richer. I don't know what, what I'm supposed to say there. That's the Jan 3 news. I wonder why they called it that. I can't conceptualize anything in crypto. Is it someone's name? Does someone named Jan have three kids? Is it January the 3rd? Oh, maybe that's what... Maybe the company was made on January 3rd. I'm just thinking outside of the box. Cause, or is it Jane? I'm going to stop talking now. That's the acquisition news. And yeah. Let's move on. And uh, here's something to think about. For those of you not looking at the screen, 93%... That is the number nine and then the number three, 93% of all Bitcoin has already been mined. For those of you who do not know or have simply forgotten, uh, Bitcoin is also a bit of a time machine, not that you can step inside of it and go into the past or into the future for that matter. But it is a time keeper. It's one of the other narratives that you, you probably won't ever hear about again. But Bitcoin keeps time pretty specifically. Uh, we know when things are going to happen. This is how like, you can sit here and say, hey, the halving is going to happen on this time or this. Or anything, all these other kinds of things. It also is a very good record and time keeper in that same exact box as well. The idea is, is that we can lightly foresee that if mining continues at this particular pace and usage and yada yada and the halvings happen over and over and over as they're, they're supposed to happen, the last fragments of Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140. I know it sounds futuristic. It's because it is. It's in the future. That's, that's why it's, the, it's a big number. 2140, the last fragments of Bitcoin will be mined. Can anyone tell me the significance of hearing that 93% of all Bitcoin has already been created? Yeah, you got it. This is where we get those crazy, um, almost almost cursed, but then did not almost curse, uh, news stories from. When, when you hear someone say Bitcoin might be $1.4 million by 2030, it's not because they're like, oh yeah, give me the monies. They're going based off of the other figures that we've had before from the movements up in the other cycles that we've had. And also the, the price increases mathematically that we've also seen as there's less Bitcoin circulating within the market. The Bitcoin halving next year was foretold back in 2015, 2016 when I was just like looking at crypto. I used to read a lot about it before. The 2024 halving was or is to be seen as the time when Bitcoin actually overtakes gold, like physical metal gold. That's quite significant because Bitcoin will have only been around for 14 to 15 years at that point. The 2028 halving is also going to see, of course, the, 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 uh, min the minted mined supply cut in half once again. This is going to cause a gigantic price explosion because at that point, I believe Bitcoin will become... It, 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 so, backing it up. It already is, but based off of the P.E. ratios and ABCs and all these other letters and things like that, it will be the rarest asset on the planet. Dragging it back, that is the year 2028 comparative to the year 2140. Today, 93% of all Bitcoin has already been mined. When you get to the year 2032, that is the time frame where the majority of analysts say that Bitcoin's price will be at a million or well over a million dollars just based off of these current figures that we have and the current amount of people that we actually have in the market. We are expecting, of cost more more people to enter the market at all times. And this is why we had news a couple of months ago that in one day, what was it, like 300,000? I don't know, something like that. A whole bunch of new Bitcoin addresses popped up in the exact same day. The idea is if, if every day we have a new 7,000 as opposed to 300K, which is a huge jump, if every day we have 7,000 new addresses, by the end of this decade, we will have billions of people in the market. You get the general idea. Once again, the issue being, is that 93% of all Bitcoin has already been created. By the time we get to, I think it was 2042, I forgot exactly how 
small the uh, the mintage is for Bitcoin, like, you know, of the having, 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 having. But this is when you might have heard those crazy numbers of like a $100 million Bitcoin. It's based off of that, the network effect, new people getting in, you know, there barely being any Bitcoin. There's less than, there's less than 7% of Bitcoin left to actually be had from mining. We have entered a very specific time in history where we are going to be able to tell people in 20 years, yeah, I was there when the first 97% of Bitcoin was being created. And they won't believe it. They won't really understand. Because if you think about it, the last 2 to 3%, the last 2 to 3% of all Bitcoin will take 100 years to mine. According to data from the website Blockchain, a total of 19.5 million Bitcoin has already been mined as of the 5th of December of this year. It's going to get real, really fast. And I know you've seen my, uh, my video titles and I know you've seen uh, the other titles on my other channel, Money Rules. And I think I've seen the comments and people are like, why are you being so dramatic? And it's like, why are you being undramatic? You literally don't understand what's taking place. We have another 116 years left to mine Bitcoin, and there already is not enough left. So just always thought, you know, I want to sprinkle this news on people every now and again, just so everyone really understands it, because we are going to enter a world where there is not enough Bitcoin for you. And it's only when you understand that Bitcoin is made for the masses, it's made for you, and 93% of Bitcoin has not only been mined, but 93% of the current supply is in the hands of the wealthiest people on the planet. That's the 93% of Bitcoin has already been mined news. 116 years. Think about that. If Bitcoin's price... Last, last part, if Bitcoin's price is expected to be $1 million to $100 million by the year 2040, what about the next 100 years after that? Everyone got it? Yeah, okay. Let's move on. Also in the news, new analysis by a London-based company called Nickel Digital Asset Management. Okay, A European digital assets hedge fund manager founded by alumni of bankers Trust, Goldman Sachs, and JP Morgan have discovered that there are 38 companies who are listed on stock exchanges who are actually holding around $12 billion worth of Bitcoin. These 38 companies, 38 companies out of 150,000 majillion companies that we actually have on the planet, are holding around 1.2% of the total supply of Bitcoin. To put that into perspective, think of the idea of how many other companies are out there that are also accumulating who are not listed. That's another really big part. A lot of people get confused sometimes when they hear that MicroStrategy is accumulating Bitcoin and they go, well, it's clearly only MicroStrategy. There are other countries, there are other companies who are also doing the exact same thing. We had a little issue a couple of months ago where people were arguing with me and they were like, dude, BlackRock's not holding any Bitcoin. Like they haven't filed with the SEC. You seem to misunderstand the power that a company that has $11 trillion under their belt actually has. You've heard it before. You've heard of companies that are worth $5 billion and people who are worth $2 billion do this. As a person, you can create a company that has no name or has a name that's based somewhere that doesn't really exist. It may only exist in, in like a literal post office. And from that company, you can create hundreds of other companies inside of it. And they're called shell companies because, you know, like, like, I made my hand like a clam and I don't know why I'm like, 
doing like anyway the point is it's very easy to create a subsidiary of a company of a subsidiary of a nonprofit of a nonprofit of a subsidiary and have 16 layers down and these can do the buying for you it's very easy and actually they take minutes to set up you got to watch documentaries this is why uh, the Panama Papers and all that other stuff was driving people completely insane because it's not a lot of effort to actually do so the point being 38 companies on the planet have 1.2% of the Bitcoin. And these are just the listed companies who have openly told us that they are actually doing so. I actually shudder to think what the world is going to be like by the end of this decade because of the... And I, and I don't say this to have you FOMO. Like, understand what I'm about to say is literally just pure fact. The amount of money that these companies are going to make is going to be like actually staggering. It's not going to be a situation where they've made like a couple billion dollars. We're like we're expecting like trillions of dollars to be created from the Bitcoin cryptocurrency market. These companies are going to be more powerful than anything we could actually begin to imagine. Same exact thing with individuals. I one of the books I was reading I read a couple of books about the cryptocurrency space. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are actually like quite informative. And the ones that I have seen, uh, and, you know, and I'll say it to you this way, like as far as like the richest Bitcoin and Ethereum holders, um, which I didn't know for a while, but of course it makes total sense. Some of the earliest people, like we talk about the pizza guy who like gave away his 10,000 Bitcoin, yada, yada. But there are tons of other people in the crypto space, and tons, handfuls who own like 28,000 Bitcoin. 47,000 Bitcoin, 200,000 Bitcoin. And it's like, what happens if Bitcoin does go to $25 million per coin? How rich are you with 47,000 Bitcoin? And they're accumulating more and more every single day. It's the same exact thing for uh, the, the price predictions that we're getting for Ether now range anywhere from 12,000 to $22,000 during the next run. What we saw, I think... Maybe end of summer, if someone was predicting a $100,000 Ether should Bitcoin like go into the seven figures area. A lot of the people who like were early Ethereum adopters, and I think Mike Novogratz is supposed to be one of them, like the entire story that uh, he met Vitalik in Brooklyn working on a computer or something like that gave him funding. And I think he was given, I think, a million Ether. Imagine having a million Ether. And that was back in 20. 15, 16. Imagine how much more he would have now. Now imagine each Ether goes to 100K. These people are going to be like egregiously like dystopian megaly rich. I try to say it not to make you FOMO or to make you scared, but it's like to put things into perspective as far as like they figured out what crypto was a while ago while the rest of the world continued to to basically sleep. And the world as we already know it is dramatically changing. We know that fiat currencies were not going to last forever as nothing does, but it's a very interesting time to uh, be on the planet to see all these uh, rapid changes because if right now we are hearing that there are 38 companies who are listed have actively been buying themselves, Imagine with multiple Bitcoin ETFs, if we have like another 180 companies who just go to BlackRock and use their ETF, how high does that number then balloon? How many Bitcoin will BlackRock alone have in their ETF? It's all these things, all these things, all these things, all these things. I, I, I think about them maybe a little bit more than I probably should, but... Uh, you can see the shifting trends. You can see all the real estate being bought up. You can see all the land being bought up. You can see all the water. If you get a chance, watch documentaries on that because, yep, companies are also doing that as well. The world is changing and it'll be the richest people who have access to these things, kind of. Um, anyway, that's a slightly another topic, but yes. 38 companies are holding 1.2% of all the Bitcoin. And these are, for those of you who don't know, these are mainly U.S. companies that they're, that they're tracking. So that's the not much time left news. And yeah, 
Let's move on. Also in sure. Wow. Okay. It says in an era desperate for financial literacy, Cash App apparently has launched a new magazine called Bread. Now this is going to sound crazy. Um, I know there's one person who's like bread, like the thing you eat. Um, I'm just going to assume that you do not know American slang from like the late 90s. Uh, Bread, dough. What are some of the other ones? I, I'm like, there's some other food things. What are the other food ones that like that, that all represent the word money? Anyway, bread is one of them. Um, that's why they called it bread. A free magazine that fuses financial education with culture. The inaugural issue, aptly titled The Bitcoin Issue, promises to demystify the world and culture of Bitcoin and hopefully reshape public perceptions. So like a lot of times whenever we get news that Coinbase is doing something or Gemini did something. It always ends up being like lightly cringy. And they're like, hey, do this and you can blah, 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 blah. And, like, and I'm like, oh, okay. This I actually like. One, I don't use Cash App. Two, the idea of like a free resource that would kind of like pack everything together for the masses to be able to learn about Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain is how things should be done. Years ago, the idea was that there was going to be an app, something online that would kind of revolutionize the way that people thought about Bitcoin. And it's just information. People don't need video games to be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go buy some Bitcoin. No, like just, just give them info. Let them understand what it is. Let them learn from it. The more people learn, the more that they know. The more that they know, usually they become more curious and then want to know more after that. So if, if you're looking for a way to like get someone into the cryptocurrency space or let them understand because we all, we all know people who don't get it, who don't understand, who have a hard time figuring out why you've been buying numbers on a screen on your computer, send them like free information, let them understand and like read what these things actually are. A lot of people don't, sad part, a lot of people don't know what inflation is or how inflation works. You think that's a joke, but there's, <laughs> there's, there's a couple people probably inside of your household that you're going to be seeing today who understand inflation because stuff went up in price in the supermarket, but they don't know why. Let them understand why and then tell them that Bitcoin goes the opposite way and is deflationary and is expected to continue rising as it you know goes the opposite way from inflation. And then their eyes will open and then they'll want to know more. It's just about actual people need information to be able to survive. That's why the world is so weird right now. And there's a photo of bread. What in the world is happening? There's a literal photo of bread and bananas. Okay. At the heart of bread's mission is a commitment to transform the often intimidating world of finance and Bitcoin into a realm that resonates with everyday people. By merging financial education with cultural insights, Bread breaks, seeks to break down barriers and make complex concepts such as Bitcoin more approachable. Yeah, cool. I love it. This, and, uh, oddly enough, this, this <coughs> of course, was not popular news. I, ex I expected that it would be because it said Cash App, and I know that's quite big in the States. Uh, but, of course, anything about financial literacy, like actual news and helping people, of course, that... That won't actually make it into the news anytime soon, but this is incredible. If you have a friend who is using Cash App, like tell them, hey, there's a free Bitcoin magazine. Learn about it before the future comes. And then, you know how many people are going to be, I don't want to say the word sad. Imagine a world where you, listening to this right now, like you right now, listening to this, we get to like the end of this decade and you've made anywhere from half a million to a million dollars plus from the cryptocurrency market. And that's because you bought and you held. That's, you know, just random thought throwing it out there. Imagine how many of your other friends and relatives and coworkers, like how angry and sad that they're going to be that they literally did not listen to you. I have, and I, and I know they're not listening, so I can say this a little bit freely. Over the years, I've told you I have friends who I've desperately tried to like get into the markets 
And there's a couple in particular who keep popping into my head, but there's one. I tried telling her, I mean, since 2018, 2019, we've sat down in cafes and I'm like, are you investing? You, you want, want to put some money away? You want to, you want to do this? And I try and help her. And she like, will literally like, look at me like I'm, you want to go to Mars tomorrow? You want to, you want to float on the moon? Like that kind of look like what is, what in the world is, is he talking about? And I spoke with her recently. This was maybe two months ago. And she was telling me how, like how many money problems she's having, how many like issues she's having with like her rent. And I, and I, and I sat there and all I could do was like lend an ear. But part of me was also like, if you had, I mean, even 1% listen to me. Like, imagine having purchased, like, $400 worth of Ether back then or something like that. Like, you would have no rental problems. Like, you'd be good for the next couple of years if you cashed out right now. It's, these, it's all these kinds of things that that go on. Um, anyway, like, just people need more education. And, and I don't know why... I do not know why financial literacy like scares people. Like, are you af- are you afraid of learning that you've been wrong this entire time, or that it opens up a brand new? Sc- and I know that people like there, there are a lot of people who are actually scared of money. Like, not like oh my gosh, like like running down the street, like you know, terrified of it. But it's something about the idea of having to deal with money. It literally like petrifies them, and I you got to get over that because we're all getting older. Things are getting more expensive. And to my other friend, not the one I was just talking about, I have another friend who saves nothing, nothing, like zero, like less than, like the number zero less than that saves nothing. And I, and I was, and I was telling them before, I was like, you know, at some point you're going to get to like 50, 55 years old and your bones will be hurting. You're not going to want to go work every single day. And they were like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'll be completely fine. And I was like, but you know, then at some point you'll you'll become sixty, and then sixty-five, and then you. No, no, no. It's, and I don't mind working. And I was like, yeah, you can say that because you're like thirty-two. You can you can you can totally throw that. It's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind getting up and doing things. But you know, so anytime you can try to educate people, I know it becomes frustrating when you try to give. Believe me, every day, right here, when you try to give people information and they just don't absorb it or don't want to absorb it. But if you've tried. And people don't listen. There's only so much that you can do. That's something I also had to teach myself. I've been trying for a decade plus, not not even just here in general, even in, in real life, trying to help people with finances, to let them figure out that they can also buy art. They can buy small property. They don't have to get into debt, all these things. And I'm just a talking bobblehead to these people until they realize, you know, what's going on. That's the Cash App has a free magazine called Bread News. I'm th- that's going to drive me insane. What are the other words? Dough, bread, moolah. Okay, I'm going to stop. All right, let's move on. In the internet is a free resource and all it takes is a couple of seconds to actually read information news. This ended up being one of the most popularly unpopular spoken about news stories that we've had like in a while. Maybe like every two or three weeks we have like one topic that pops up like this. But typically every time the thing that gets sensationalized ends up also being completely wrong. So I'll go over it and then I'll, you know, I'm trying to keep my calm because I'm tired of people spreading stupidity within this space. Tether apparently froze 41 for one different wallets controlled by people because of the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, the OFAC specifically designated nationals list on Saturday. So there were 41 Tether accounts that got frozen and the people using them could not use their Tether anymore. Tether described the actions as a precautionary measure in a blog post On-chain data shows that several wallets have been using coin mixing services in the past six months. One of the frozen wallets is associated with a $625 million hack, which apparently, allegedly, was done by the Korea not to the south but the other direction. They said 
By executing voluntary wallet address freezing of new additions to the SDN list and freezing previously added addresses, we will be able to further strengthen the positive usage of stablecoin technology and promote a safer stablecoin ecosystem for all users. This was said by Tether CEO Paolo Ardoino. So I'm going to say a couple things. One, Tether is a company. Got it? Two, Tether is not decentralized. Everyone got that? Tether, the company, is a centralized company who made a centralized coin. Everyone got it? At no point did Tether ever say that their coin was decentralized as they are a centralized company. Everyone got it? Tether puts their coin on other blockchains as a form of a security measure and also as a way to promote decentralization in the event that another chain collapses, freezes, has a bad time. If they put everything on top of Ether and Ether slows down or falls apart, Tether's going to have a bad time. So many stable coins tend to put their stable coins on multiple and issue them and mint them on multiple different chains as a way for security also for the company as well. You don't put all of your eggs in one basket. The news is, is that a centralized company with a centralized coin has been working with government agencies to freeze wallets, to freeze addresses that could have potentially been associated with something that governments might not like. This made sensational news. I'm going to see if you can see this one right here. It says, Tether to start freezing wallets. Is your wallet safe? Tether is the exact same thing as Coinbase, as Kraken, as Gemini, as Fourth Name, whatever the other one there is as well. They work with law enforcement because they're a centralized company. There's, a, there's an office that you can go to. And as we have seen that, there are many crimes done with the US dollar and the euro and the yen and all the other fiat currencies. The idea is that apparently, allegedly, people may also be doing illicit things with digital currencies as well. Therefore, centralized entities work with other centralized entities to make sure that funds are frozen or stopped or whatever the actual case might be. We've seen this from Kraken. We've seen this from Binance. We've seen this from Coinbase. Many, 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 many times. I remember the first time. I remember the first time that news got out that Coinbase had frozen a few wallets and was not letting people take their money off. You wouldn't believe how many people were screaming, screaming decentralization on Twitter and online. And then you have to remind them, no, 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 sorry, my dear. You gave your coins to a centralized entity. They control your coins as long as they're on their platform. A lot of people don't read through the, uh, the FAQs or anything else like that and are usually surprised when they can't take their money off. You gave it to a company. It's the same exact thing with a bank. There was an article a couple of hours ago and I rolled my eyes I, allegedly, once again, JP Morgan is alleged to have frozen customer accounts and they're not letting people take their money off of the bank account. And there was one customer who allegedly had been there for 18 years and wasn't allowed to get their money out. And it was like, this is atrocious. It's, this, is, this, is, this is terrible. And I'm like, it's a bank. It's JP Morgan. You literally, when you sign the papers, you, see, you say that you're relinquishing your funds over to them. Have you ever tried to close an account, anyone out there? When you try and close an account and move your money away from it or take all your money out of a bank account, they will literally have the manager come talk to you and ask you if this is really what you want to do. It's, a, it's meant to be like a bit of a scare tactic. They want your money to remain in the bank. It's not really yours. They use your money to trade with. That's why at the end of the year, you get like a, a, a half of a percent return to your bank account. The bank is you. How do you think the bank is getting that? They're not giving you free money. They're using your money that you've deposited with them to trade in the markets and other things around the world. And when they've made billions from it, they go, okay, here you go. Here's a dollar fifty. That's how it works. So bringing it on back, 
Um, Tether is not starting to freeze wallets. Tether has been doing this for a very long time. When you get as big as a as a country, Tether's huge. Like, like you, you, you don't understand how much Tether there actually is out there. Like, Tether's movements per year are larger than certain countries. When you get that big, countries and entities and banks take notice and they go, hey, you got to be regulated. Can you help us in some sort of way? Why do you think Tether has become so extensively transparent over the course of the last five years? This is an article from 2022. There's also one from 2021 as well. It says, stablecoin issuer Tether freezes three addresses holding $160 million of assets upon law enforcement request. Yes, that's how, that's how stable coins from a centralized company on a centralized chain work. So, no, this is not the first time that Tether is doing this. It will not be the last time. If you choose to continuously relinquish your funds to centralized entities, they're going to do centralized things. The point of Bitcoin... And blockchain is you are meant to self-custody. It's your money. You're meant to be in charge of it. However, it's a lot easier to just hand over your money to someone else and say, you deal with it. And then when they freeze your, you deal with it, people get upset. So yeah, Tether is centralized. We all know that as are other companies, as are cryptocurrency exchanges. And as I told you over the last couple of years, as are um, DeFi projects. And I think a lot of people left the channel and didn't want to hear it when I told you years ago that these decentralized finance projects were not actually decentralized. A lot of times we heard nothing about nodes. We heard nothing about validators around the world validating transactions. It always came out to be that there were literally multiple times it was always Three guys sitting inside of an office, usually in San Francisco. They got a letter. They were told by law enforcement, hey, we don't like what you're doing. You got to shut down. And a lot of these protocols disappeared because they're centralized. There's nothing hyper decentralized right now except for a few actual blockchains. Uh, last word of advice as far as DeFi goes. Remember that one DeFi project? Who disappeared? No, 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 no. No, this was a crypto exchange. This was a cryptocurrency exchange that disappeared during the entire FTX fiasco. You might remember this. One crypto exchange disappeared, and people were like, "Where's my money, bro?" And then people began to look through the actual um, terms and conditions on the website, and there was a part that said, "When you deposit your funds onto our website, your funds are are ours." So when they disappeared, they basically made off with, I think, a couple hundred million dollars and people tried to sue them. And guess who lost? The people who were using their platform because the judge ruled. She's like, no, it says it right here. You deposit your money on that platform. It's theirs. They can use it freely how they choose to use it. That's the Tether has started freezing accounts. That's crazy. That's the first time we've ever heard that before. I'm sure that'll never happen again. These these things are basically banks at this point. You 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 think because you can transact and tether to Bitcoin that Tether is also just you know hyper decentralized? I do sincerely hope that you've all enjoyed. I hope you find time in your day, 20, 30 minutes, to go read a little bit more about crypto, to go read a book. Watch a small documentary if you have a friend who needs some kind of help because a lot of you are seeing and will be seeing more friends who are going to begin to ask you uh, how to make a million dollars from the cryptocurrency market because they don't understand. So start sending them information as to how they can understand, how they can slowly put money into this market to get a feel for it, to become more accustomed and learned about what blockchain is and what crypto is because people hate the idea of asking you, how do I get it? How do I get a million dollars? And you tell them, educate yourself. It'll drive them insane. But then they'll realize you got to educate yourself before you, you, th you think, you think people make billions of dollars being stupid. Think about that. 
Think about that for one second. This just drove this drove me up the wall a couple of years ago. I, I'm no, multiple blah, blah, blah. multiple times in my life I've seen this and I and I couldn't conceptualize how it actually became a thing. You must have seen this. So even this was years ago when like Facebook was like still a thing. I remember seeing posting people posting stuff like, "Oh, I hope I find a million dollars," or posting things about like really fancy, beautiful, lovely houses. I remember there was and th- th- this house was clearly like forty-seven million dollars. Somebody was like, ah, "Oh, I ho- hope, I hope I get it. I want this house." You know, blah, blah blah. And I was like, "If you got that house, you wouldn't know what to do with it. You literally would not begin to comprehend how much it cost for the upkeep of the lawn. You have to pay for water." light, gas, you have to fix the roof. It costs money every single hour, every single day to heat that place, to run that gigantic house. There's so many people who want to become rich but have no idea what to do with it. If you got it, this is why so many people who end up winning the lottery, they go broke in like three years. Can you imagine winning $150 million and in three years you are broke? That means over a thousand days you had with that money, not one second did you take to go to a literal financial advisor and say, help me. I had 150 million. I looked at my bank account. There's 30 million left. I need help. I saw a documentary years ago. This was a I forgot what language it was in. It was a documentary about this couple who had like won the lottery. I want to say somewhere in Europe. They won the lottery and it, it, it wasn't like an egregious amount of money. It was like five, six, seven million. It was, you know, still big, still big, but not nothing compared to the, you know, uh, Powerball and all this other stuff that people are winning now. This couple, they bought like a fancy, weird looking house. They were giving money to all their friends and relatives and stuff like that. And then at some point, this family, this, this, this couple... They went to Monaco and they said they were sitting at a cafe and they realized that while they were sitting there, they were like, we, we burned through a lot of our money. They were taking first class business flights everywhere, just traveling, beautiful, beautiful, amazing photos and all these lovely memories. And they said by chance, by chance, by chance, by chance, they sat there and this couple started talking to them next and they said, hey, where are you guys from? And they said, oh, we're from so-and-so. They said, ah, oh, okay, we have friends who live around there. They're talking, you know, having a conversation, and then the, the 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 lotto company goes. The company, the lotto couple goes. Yeah, you know, we actually we actually won the lotto, and they go, "Oh my gosh, no way!" You know, what did you guys what did you guys do? And they go, "We bought a this, and we did this, and we got five new cars." And the and the couple who they were talking to, they didn't know, was actually extremely extremely wealthy. And they were like, "What did what did you invest in?" And they were like, "What? Where'd you?" Where'd you put your money? They said, we didn't put our money anywhere. That rich couple helped them buy a bunch of houses and a bunch of property. And that's why the, like, in the documentary, they were showing years later and they were like, this is why we can still live a nice lifestyle because they taught us with our last like 1.5 million to like put it into property. It's insane. Like what, what they, they, it's crazy to think that people have more of a dream to instantly become rich as, an, as opposed to knowing what to actually do with it. This is why you still see so many people talking about like, I can't wait to like cash out and get a Lambo. And it's like, good luck. Good luck with no house, no investments, and you driving down the street in this half a million dollar car while you still live in a bad neighborhood. Good luck. It doesn't make any sense. You have to learn about money. You have to learn where to put your money, what to do with it. What do you, like, what do you, there's so many people who are expecting to, like, make a pretty good amount of change from this bull run. What are you going to do with it? Because, listen, realistically, it's almost 2024. You cash out 2024, 2025, where are you by 2030? Are you, are you sleeping in your five, six, seven-year-old Lambo? Are you trying to sell it for less than you bought it for because it has dents and, and like it, you know, it just looks terrible now? Why would you not prepare for the future? Why would you not learn what to do with your money, how to continue to make it grow? The world is crazy. The world is absolutely insane. 
There's so many people like that. Like the idea of instantly becoming rich is such a dream. If you just learned how to build money and how to invest. Anyway, as you can see, I have a lot to say about that because I've, I've come into contact with so many people over the years who tell me like, oh my gosh, I want to be rich. And I'm like, you don't know what to do with it. You have no idea what to do with it. I had um, this, okay, last, last thing. This was 2000. 10, 2011, long, long, long time ago. I remember I was, I was with friends who I hadn't seen in a while and it was maybe like 11 of us. And at some point, someone started talking about like hypotheticals, like what would you do if somebody gave you a house or somebody gave you this? And it was, it was like one of those kind of things, like, you know, like so everyone at the table's dreams, you know, dreams and wishes of, you know, better days. And then I was like, okay, I have one. And I was like, what would you do if someone gave you $100 million? Somebody was like, I would buy a house and I'd buy a jet ski and then I'd buy a yacht and I'd probably do this. And I was like, how are you making money? What? How are you making money from your money? What do you, I, I have $100 million. I'm like, yeah, that'll, that'll, the way that you're spending and you having no actual investments, like you can, you can buy a, a $30 million home that you live inside of. But it's going to cost you about half a million dollars per year for the upkeep on everything that you actually have to do. How are you making money? And no one at the table, not one person could answer it correctly. Not one person. They all had, well, I'd give 20 million to my mother and 20 million to my, and I was like, they're also going to burn through that money. If you took a million dollars, the average number that tends to always pop up, of course, it can be more. Is if per per million dollars you can make roughly around five to six thousand in rental income per month. If you have ten million dollars, ten million, you make between fifty to sixty thousand dollars per month in rental income. Think of that. Imagine making sixty thousand dollars per month just from rental income. If you do that with a hundred million, it's six hundred thousand. Just to throw it out there. If you gave your family member. $10 million and told them, you can only buy real estate with it. Let me help you. They would look at you like you're crazy. And then you would tell them, you are going to make $60,000 plus because, you know, rent goes up for the rest of your life every single month. Even, even better. Can you imagine? Can you imagine giving a million dollars to a family member and you say, the only way I will give this to you is if you are financially literate. You have to take a financial literacy test by the time I give you this money and you have to pass it, then you get the million. Think of how you would change their lives forever. Always learn, continue to learn, learn more every day. You have to, you have to, you have to, you have to. There are going to be so many people who make good money during this bull run. They're going to cash out and have no idea what to do with it. They're going to burn through all that money and then be angry in 10 years when you see your other friends or other people in the cryptocurrency space living large. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I do hope that you've all enjoyed. I do hope that you all are having a great day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, and or supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.